All right, we're ready to uh, start the, and finish the book of Joshua tonight. We've been, uh, uh, well, it's turned out to be about, I think, nine different studies in it, and what an interesting semester we've had in our class situation. Um, the, uh, the Sunday morning classes would usually have about ten studies in each of the semesters, and I'm just, I, I'm amazed that we were able to cover the book of Joshua as well as we have, and you may not think as well as we have, but... Uh, uh, normally when I study a book, we get one or two chapters in, and we've, we've covered almost every chapter. And tonight, we're going to finish up by looking at these last two chapters of the, of the book of Joshua. But uh, the way we've outlined the book of Joshua is there on the screen. I don't know how much of that uh, you're, you're able to read, but if you know generally this about the book of Joshua, where does Joshua fit in Bible history? Well, they've left, ex they, they've, they've left uh, Egypt in the book of Exodus. They've been to Mount Sinai. They've got the Ten Commandments. They've, in, in the book of Numbers, they get up to the edge of the promised land, and they're ready to go in and take the promised land that God gave to, promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of unbelief, they were not able to go in, into that promised land. And so they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And, uh, the, and so the background of the book of Joshua is that he lives after all of this has transpired, at least most of this has transpired, we introduced Joshua by pointing out the fact that in that battle where, uh, uh, the Amal where the Amalekites came down against the Jews, who were just an infant nation, really they were not a nation at all. Can you imagine how ill-equipped they were for warfare when they've left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and all of a sudden here's this massive army that comes down against them. That's whenever they have to hold up Moses' hands until the battle is won. The general of the Jewish army is Joshua. So he has great leadership ability, at least evidenced by that, uh, in, the, in those early chapters, or pardon me, in, uh, in, in the book, early chapters of Exodus. And then Joshua goes part of the way up Mount Sinai. Whenever uh, uh, Moses is up there to get the Ten Commandments and Moses comes down, Moses has a conversation with Joshua on the way down. So he, he's an important individual, and we, we have no idea as to how he reached that place of prominence in, the, uh, in, the li in, the, in Moses' life. But Moses knew him and saw the great ability that he had. And then finally, after they conquer, conquer the land on the east side of the Jordan River, and keep in mind that Moses is, is the one who, uh, uh, who helps them conquer that land, all of this land from all the way up here, all the way down through here, all that on that all of that land on the east bank is the land that Moses helped them capture. And sometimes we lose sight of that. We look at a map of how the, tribe, how the land was divided among the tribes, and we, give Josh, we just think Joshua did all of that. No, Moses does all of that. And there's an interesting verse tonight, something that uh, I, had, I, I had forgotten. Well, I knew about it, but I had forgotten one aspect of it. And when I saw that in preparing for, for the lesson, I was absolutely amazed. Evidently, they hardly had to fight any battle at all. Whenever, whenever they captured all of this land on the east side of the Jordan, they, they evidently had not to fight many battles at all. If I've read that verse right, and you can, you, you can read, you, we can read it together tonight, and we will read that, that verse together. But I found that really, really interesting, that uh, they conquered that without marching around the walls of Jericho or fighting the battles at Ai or some of the things that uh, Joshua did. You may recall how many kings Joshua defeated. Anybody, anybody remember that number? Uh, there's some, some, some number between 30 and 32. Would, would that help? Yeah. We've talked a lot about uh, a teacher at Fried Hardman years ago, and, uh, Brother, uh, Brother Hall. He, he taught spoken English, which kids who've been in leadership training class know what that's all about. You're allowed to speak until you make a mistake. And Brother Hall asked a young man, said, well, young man, how'd you do on the test? He said, Brother Hall, I got between, there was a 10 question test. He said, I got between four and six. And Brother Hall said, well, young man, why didn't you just say you got five then? That's the only number. And so the number between 30 and 32 is 31 kings. And so when they get over here on, on the west bank of Jordan and, and, and they really have to fight for all of this land, there are 31 kings that Joshua helps them uh, uh, to defeat. And so uh, that, that, that's what that outline of the book of Joshua is all about. They, they get that land, they divide that land up, they, they have the cities of refuge, and that's some of the things that we've talked about, cities of refuge. were So if you accidentally kill someone, 
uh, you could find a place of refuge. And so uh, uh, God, they, they, they were talking, Moses talked about them, but it's in Joshua's day that's, that's, there's, that that is done. In the book of Joshua, we also learn about the land the Levites got. When the land is divided among the 12 tribes, the tribe of Levi gets no land at all. They got cities and some little land surrounding the, uh, those cities, but there was no geographical begin at this place and go so many miles south, and that's where your boundaries are. They received 48 cities throughout all of, uh, uh, all of uh, the, the promised land. And so uh, uh, it was their responsibility to be priests, but they were also to be those who instructed and taught people of the law of God. That was God's original plan. Evidently, they didn't do a very good job of it because it's not long after Joshua uh, dies that uh, the people began really to, to leave God. And so we have arrived when we get to Joshua chapter, uh, uh, when, when, when we get to Joshua chapter, I get this so it'll go that way. When we get to Joshua chapter 23, we have arrived at the place where now Joshua is an old man. And, and it's interesting, and that, that's why uh, in, in the notes here, sometimes I'll put uh, uh, notes in, in, on, the, on the screen. You'll find verses from chapter 23 as well as chapter 24 because it's two sermons that Joshua preached, and it's all, it's, in many respects it's the same sermon. And if you'll analyze it, look at it real carefully, you'll see he stole the sermon from Moses. Sometimes people don't understand where young preachers get sermons. They get them from old preachers. And, and old preachers get the sermons that they preached when they were young preachers. And uh, it's rather interesting. Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 13 is a copy of Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. I don't mean the exact copy by any means. But if things are important to be said, they can be said again and again. And so Moses, at the end of his life, gave a speech to the, to, uh, to the Jewish nation. And that is exactly what Joshua, that is, that is exactly what, uh, uh, Joshua does in relationship to this. And so what I want us to do is, is to, uh, to, to take time and to look at some, some of the... Somebody look in Joshua chapter 20, 23 and verse 1 and see if you can give me some indication about, uh, 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 about Joshua's age at a time like this. Is, it, is, is that where the verse is found, or is that over in chapter 24? It, we know his age, do we not? He says, I'm an old man. And so he calls together the, the people of God. And uh, I, I tried in my own mind to explore, is this just one, one thing or two things? And whether it's, uh, uh, is it one thing or is it, is it two things Two different lessons that he, and it looks very definitely like it's two different occasions just by the audience that is there in relationship to this. But he's got all of the nations come together. And so he says, Now, now I, I, you know, I, I, I am an old man. And so as we begin looking at uh, these things, he then rehearses what God has done with that nation. Look at look in Joshua chapter 23. And most of it is in Joshua chapter 24. But in Joshua chapter 23, Joshua reminds them that I have, we've conquered this land and I have divided this land out among you. Uh, that's, that's what, in, is that in verse th 3, 4, and 5 or something like that? Verse 3, you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is He who has fought for you. That's Joshua chapter 23, verse 3. And verse 4 said, And I've divided this land out among you. And so there are about six or eight verses, six or eight chapters in the book of Joshua that's really just a geographical description of where the, where the tribes were. And I think that's one of the reasons that enabled us to cover uh, 24 chapters. It doesn't take long to say, if you wanted to look for these on a map, you could, but it's just the names of locations and everything. But it was important for that to be recorded so the people would also have, have access, access to that. In verse 5, he says, The Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight so that you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you. And so we've got almost a contrast where he said, You've conquered this nation, now drive them out. 
And so what, what has happened as he's taken these nations and defeated their kings, uh, the people are still in the land. And so they're not a kingdom anymore, but they need to be driven out of this land. And so they had not done everything that the Lord has uh, told them to do. But the Lord says back in verse 4, uh, I, the, With all the nations I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And so He says, Therefore be very courageous. We'll come back to verse 6 in just a minute. But go to chapter 24. And here is a very, very interesting chapter to look at. In verse 2, Joshua said to all of the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of, and if you've got the old King James, you have the word flood. And that Hebrew word means an expanse of water. Well, Abraham and Terah did not live on the other side of the flood. And so the expanse of water, and is indicated in the new King James, on the other side of the river. And that river is the river Euphrates. And so he says, Abraham and Terah uh, were on the other side of the river. They dwelt on the other side of the river in old times. Verse 3 says, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him through all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And to Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to, uh, to possess. But, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I, and I plagued Egypt. And all this is is just a retelling of, the, of those early chapters, and, and it's a great summation. It's one of the better summations of it. And I plagued Egypt according to, what I, uh, according to what I did among them. Afterwards I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came uh, to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your, fa- your fathers with chariots and horsemen in the, in the sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and He put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them and covered them. What you may not be aware of is that whenever they came to the, to the Red Sea, unlike the movie The Ten Commandments, that cloud moved over and it became darkness to that Egyptian uh, uh, army. And uh, the reality is they actually crossed at night. And uh, so the, the, evidently the light from that pillar of fire that was that was there as a manifestation of God, uh, uh, whenever the cloud was there, perhaps it's what provided the light as the Israelites were able to cross o- over the Red Sea. And he says, uh, uh, And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. That's the, the east bank. And they fought with you, but I gave them into your hands, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. We'll come, we'll come back to that comment in just a minute. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel, and he sent and he called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. What do you remember about Balaam? If I say Balaam, would you say donkey? It, 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 would that help you identify he is the man who talked to his donkey. And, uh, and, and it's an amazing story in the Bible. Somebody in a Wednesday night uh, devotional here about what, uh, within the last month, talked about, uh, about this very incident. And, uh, and so he, he tried to get Balaam to come. Now, geographically, if you'll look at it, Balaam's over in Mesopotamia. Balaam is over in Ur of the Chaldees, over, not in Ur of the Chaldees, but over in that area. And so when they get to the land of the Amorites, uh, or pardon me, to the land of the Moabites and everything, the king of Moab says, we, got, we need some help here. And so he sends messengers to Balaam. And I remember once I did just sort of an estimation looking at a Bible map, and I think it was some seven or 800 miles, they traveled to get over to where Balaam was. And they offered Balaam all of this money. And so then they had to travel 700 miles to come back to Balak and said, he's not going to come. So uh, Balak says, oh, well, I'll send more money and greater messengers. So now they got 700 miles to go back. And with greater uh, uh, money and greater, more noble men uh, sent to them. And then they've got to travel 700 miles. Uh, you, you've got to understand, there's a long time-lapse thing there. Now, I don't have many miles you can go in, in, in a day in those ancient days and everything, but if, but if, but if you're walking on foot or, or riding an animal that's pretty slow, 
you're talking about 20 or 30 days just to, just to travel 700 miles or maybe eight, seven or 800 miles it was. And uh, so we're talking, about, we're talking about two or three months, maybe even four months period of time where all of this transpires, while all of this is happening. But then, but then he says, But I would not listen to Balaam. That's in verse 10. Uh, therefore, he continued to bless, therefore he continued to bless you, so I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And so now they've conquered that land that, that, that's on the east bank that's over there. They've kind of conquered all, all of this land on, on this side of the Jordan River. And then he says, then you crossed over Jordan and you, got, you arrived over here in Jericho. And you know what transpired, or we know the things that transpired at Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Uh, also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, but I deliver them into your hands. And then here's that interesting verse. But I sent the hornet. Do you know about this? I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. That's an amazing concept. Uh, it's mentioned, by the way, back over in the book of Numbers about I've sent the hornet. I believe it's in Numbers. Could it be in Deuteronomy? But God in some way afflicted those Amor the Amorite nations, those nations that were on the east bank with hornets. Anybody ever been stung by a bee? You'd rather be stung by a bee or by a wasp? A, a, a bee. As much as a bee sting hurts, I remember one of my, one of my grandchildren uh, uh, says I'm allergic to bee stings. And all it meant was it hurt him. I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, it wasn't that he had his throat swelling up or anything. I just found that real interesting. I'm allergic to bee stings. And, and I got him to describe what it was. Well, it just really hurts is the way he described it. Uh, well, uh, I've had a wasp sting. I don't recall ever being stung by a hornet. You know, if you've ever knocked down a wasp nest and been stung by you know, wasps that come off that nest. I don't know why any kid would ever do it, but it was the fun game we did every summer. And I was a baby in the family. They gave me the stick to knock the wasp nest down with, you know, and I, and I loved it because it made me look like I was a big guy in the family. And, uh, but a hornet sings. Some of you are shaking your head. You had a hornet sing. It's even worse. Now, can you imagine? Here's this army that come across the Red Sea. It's come down to Mount Sinai. It's had all of that manna. And now, after 40 years of being taken care of by God, they go up and he says, and I sent hornets in there to help you out. Uh, can you imagine uh, what that's like? Anybody ever been bit by fire ants? You know, if, if, you're, if, uh, if you had a uh, you know, 40-acre farm and it had fire ants all the way over it, how long, would you want to sell it? You, you understand what I'm talking about. And so when these hornets come up into that land, now the Lord said they were there to help you. And I, find, I found that actually amazing. And the thing that, that amazes me, he says, the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword and with your bow. And so he said, I, I, gave, I, I gave you that land, but it was not something that you conquered by using your sword and your bow. Though the word says you fought against them indicates they were, they were somewhat involved in that. But I don't know that I'd really thought those, thought those hornets going through. And then he says, I've given you the land for which you did not labor, cities which you did not build, and you dwelt in them. You eat of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. I remember as a child thinking that God was unfair. Uh, I remember being taught this concept in a Bible class, and they got to go in there and they got to take those, take those houses, and they didn't build those houses. And, and they had those fields that were planted, and they didn't, they didn't plow the fields. There were vineyards that were there. And I remember as a child, and I never verbalized it because I was afraid uh, people would think I was angry, at, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, I was mocking God. I couldn't figure out that, why that was fair. I don't know if you've ever struggled with that or not. Uh, how could God, those people had worked and had labored, and all of a sudden God takes all that land away from them. It's, the answer is found in the book of Genesis. When in Genesis chapter 15, God says to Abraham, 
that your descendants are going to go down into the land of the, uh, in, in, into a foreign land. We know the land of Egypt. And they'll be there 400 years and then they'll come back and I will give them this very land that you're standing on right now. Well, why don't you just go ahead and give it to me right now? And one little phrase. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What does that mean? Who owned that land? Well, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And it's just as though God, if, uh, if you've got rental property, if that's a good way to think about it, God had rented out that land to the, to, to the, uh, the, to the Amorites. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, but they became more and more and more and more and more evil. If you had tenants in re rental of property, you could put up with a lot. But finally the time would come whenever they, they would have just pushed it so far, they would have tipped the scales. And you'd say, that's it, out of here. You're out of here. And that's what the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, so in Leviticus, that chapter that talks about a man is not to lie with a, another man like he lies with a woman, that's talking, that's descriptive of some of the things that was happening in that land that the Amorites were committing. And the Lord said in, uh, in, in, in the book of Leviticus that that land is going to vomit these people off that land. What kind of tenants were they? Well, they made mockery of everything that was sacred and because of the sexual immorality, and, and that's, that's the topic of discussion. That was not the only way that they had denied God, but it's the way that's discussed in that chapter and says the land's going to vomit them out. And then he turns right around and he says, and when you get in that land, don't you do what they did. Don't you partake of what they partake of, lest the land vomit you out also. Who owns America? And how close are we for the iniquities of America being full? And this land vomits out those of us who are on this land. I mean, you, that's a, to me, that's a very, very sobering thing. The Bible says God will turn into hell every, every nation, every nation that forgets Him. And so then, Joshua having uh, discussed all of these things, then give, gives a final charge to, uh, uh, to, to the people. And, and it's found in chapters 23, starting back in verse 6, where Joshua, go back to chapter 23, verse 6, and Joshua says, Therefore, therefore be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. Unless you go among these nations that remain among you, you shall not make mention of the names of their gods. We've made that comment several times. When you take those idols and you wipe them out, don't ever speak the name of that God again. Your children would grow up ignorant of any concept of Baal or Ashtaroth. Isn't that amazing? Uh, that to me is, is a concept that, 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 that is, if they grow up in, in a society, and the, the Jewish society was a closed society in many respects, and you never hear the words Baal or Ashtaroth, you couldn't even ask about it. You could not say, well, how did the people who worship Baal worship? They don't know Baal. What were their gods like? They don't know. And so the Lord says, you make sure you wipe them out. You shall not serve them nor bow down, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one has been able to stand against you uh, to, uh, uh, until this day. And so there, there is this, this final charge uh, that, that is being given. I'm not sure exactly how far down in, the, in, in this I I need to go. We'll come back to this chapter in just a minute. But go over into chapter 24. And in chapter 24, verse 14, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and truth. Does that sound somewhat like John 4, 24? God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And so serve Him in sincerity and in truth. 
and put away the gods which your fathers have served on the other side of the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And so now we've got this charge that, jo that Joshua gives to them, and he says, now I'm an old man. You know, I, I was there, and we've taken this land. God wants you to go back, go ahead, and finish what I have given you to do. Now, as we shall study, uh, you know, on Wednesday nights, uh, in the next semester, we'll be studying the book of Judges. And that's what we're going to find out. The problem in the book of Judges is the very problem that's introduced right here whenever they did not do what, what, uh, what Joshua told them to do. And, and so you, you've got this final charge. And I'm going, to, I'm going to stop right here in chapter 24 and come back to it in just a minute because there's a couple of things that we need to notice. And, and that has to do with the burial of Joseph and Eliezer. And we, we'll come back to uh, some of these other things in a minute. But look down in, uh, uh, well, in verse 30, well, verse 29 talks about the burial of Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of God, died being 110 years old. Anybody know anybody else in the Bible lived to be 110 years of age and died at 110? I just think it's interesting. I just found that matter of trivia, and that's Joseph. When they left the land of Egypt, Joseph lived to be 110. And now when they come back to, uh, uh, to, to that promised land, Joshua lives to be 110. And it tells the place where they buried him. So Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for, done for the Lord. And then all of a sudden, just stuck right in here, something that you've, that you've forgotten. The bones of Joseph, the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem in the plot of, of, of ground, which Jacob had brought from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. The bones of Joseph. They were in Egypt 430 years to the exact same day. And so uh, I'm not sure exactly how long Joseph lived uh, in that 430 year period of time. The Bible says another generation, another, uh, another king arose that did not know Joseph. And so, but, but it's been nearly 400 years. And the closing chapter of the book of Genesis, uh, uh, Joseph says, the Lord's, uh, you know, my dad died and I carried him back. I, when Jacob died, just, uh, the early part of chapter 50, they carry Jacob back and bury him back up where Abraham and, and, uh, and Sarah and Isaac are buried. They take him back up. And, but now Joseph's ready to die, and he says, God is going to come, and He's going to take you out of this land. And when you go, take my bones. Uh, I don't know who was in charge of the bones. Does that make sense? But for 400 years... You talk about a, a family heirloom that was handed down from, from one to another to another. And I don't know, I sometimes wonder about Egyptian embalming. That's where he was. And it would not be out of the realm of possibility, would it, that his, his body had been embalmed, like, like we think about the mummies are embalmed and everything. Well, what do you do? What, what, what do you do with uh, 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 things like that? How, how do you, uh, well, <laughs> now that we have cremation, I guess, I guess we, we, we have to deal with it more. I mean, normally we'd just take, we'd take care of it. What are you going to do with the ashes of, indi of individuals? And that's, that's sort of a, a weird kind of thing to do. I, I remember Judy's grandmother, if I take just a minute to chase an interesting grandmother rabbit. Uh, uh, she grew up, well, she, she never went to school a day in her life. She, could, she arrived at about a third grade ability to read or something like that and went to work out in a, in a cotton mill when she was nine years of age and, and she had a real interesting life. But her daughter moved down, down here to Orlando. That had been Jewel's sister. You know, many of you will remember Jewel. Moved to Orlando. And, and so when, uh, uh, when, when, uh, when, when Dolly's husband died, I believe his name was Barney, when Barney died... She had him cremated, and that bothered grandmother unbelievably. And she said, uh, and, and she said, and, and, and she's got Barney, he's on the shelf, he's on the mantle in there, he's on that shelf in the mantle. And so the time came whenever grandmother was going to come down to see, uh, 
to see her daughter, Dolly, and Judy and I were going to bring grandmother down here. And I thought Judy said this. Judy told me that, Dan, you're the one who said this. And it does sound a little bit more like what Dan would say than what Judy would say, but I think Judy said it. To this day, I think she said it. She said, what if I die while I'm down there? You know, you know, you know what they'll do? And so she was really, you've got to understand, this is, this is ancient Alabama, you know. I mean, she, her, she, uh, she was there whenever the Daniel Boone came across the mountain. That's what, how old I thought she was and everything. Anyway, well, what if I die? Well, I'm just not going to go. What if I die? And somebody said, Grandmother, we promise you that we will not let them cremate you if you die. And Judy said, We'll just throw you to the alligators and let them eat you. <laughs> and, <laughs> but we did get to God, Dolly to come on. Now here's the bones of Joseph, by the way. And they carry the bones of Joseph down there, down, down there, and they bury that. And then all of a sudden we read about Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died. Eleazar. Oh, yeah, he's back over there in the book of Numbers. He's back over there in, uh, he's mentioned back over there before, before, I'm trying to say he was one of those who entered the promised land who left the land of Egypt and he was above 20 years of age. We often say that there were only two individuals above the age of, of 20 who went to the promised land. But here's another one. And the reason we say that that way is the Levites are not included in that number. When we talk about 603,000 550 uh, individuals uh, who left the land of Egypt. We're not talking about the tribe of Levi. And so the Levites are outside that number. And, and I believe there's another one of the, another, another one of the priests that's mentioned. Uh, because when Nadab and Abihu are, uh, uh, are, are moved out of the picture, Leviticus chapter 10 says it's, it's uh, Eleazar and Phinehas. No, maybe it's Hopna and Phinehas there. Anyway, there, he's mentioned over there. So, so whenever we say there were only two that entered the promised land, we're, we're saying of those that were numbered. And so here's one, here's one of those individuals. And they buried him uh, in, in a hill belonging to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in the mountains of Ephraim. I just found that, found that rather interesting that in this book that's just filled with great biblical truth, and all of a sudden we get bones and burials uh, 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 thrown thrown in, into this part of that. Well, let's, let's, uh, let, let's change directions here and go back and look at some important truths from these. That is, uh, go back to chapter 23 again, and these are some of the fine lessons, truths to be learned from Joshua chapter 23 and 24, and that is, your work's not finished. One of the dangers those of us who are older face as we get older is we don't have the energy we used to have and sometimes we, don't, we, uh, we, we, we stop doing things that we're able to do. Because we cannot do all the things we used to be able to do, we stop doing anything. And uh, I remember once when we were over there on 36th Street, and uh, the, uh, whoever was in charge of the educational program says, I can't not get anybody to teach the little children for, the, for this, the, the, this quarter study. And so I said, well, I'll take care of it. And so I went to older women in the church. You know, not that we have any older women in the church, but that's a better way to describe them than the way uh, Paul describes them, as aged women in the church. Brother Camp used to say the reason aged women don't teach, any, teach younger women is there's no woman in the church who will admit she's aged. So, but I went to the older women in the church, and I said, when you, years ago, you used to do a lot of teaching, didn't you? Oh, yes, I, I taught the two to three-year-olds for years and years. And I said, you know what those little three-year-old kids need? They need grandmothers in there teaching them. They don't need mothers. And so uh, some of those ladies came out of retirement, I think particularly of Jean Townsend, and, and, and that's what, that, it really built a fire under Jean, and, and uh, I think I remember her especially, but there were some others. Folks, as you get older and you don't have the energies that you used to have, don't you quit. There's a place you have in the kingdom of God that is, that is unbelievably important. And the words of encouragement that you can give to those who are younger, it, 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 you know, it's remarkable what that means. But there are things that we can do. Those of you who are retired have more time on your hand to visit folks in the hospital than you did when you, when you, when you were working 50 or 60 hours a week. And, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a great, great avenue 
And there's all sorts of avenues. And that sermon we talked about, let's wash each, each other's feet. There are things that, uh, that those who are older and retired, you may not have the energy to do as much as you used to do, but there's a tremendous opportunity for you to do a lot more. And, and that's, that, that's one of the lessons uh, that I wanted to, uh, 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 to, to make. And then there is this second one, and that is uh, uh, that your destiny is determined, and what happens in your life, is determined by the choices that you make. They chose not to drive out those nations. And there was the consequences of that which they, which, uh, which they did. Look back in chapter 23. In verse 11 he says, Be careful, uh, take careful heed, chapter 23, verse 11, to yourself that you love the Lord, or else... If you, do not, if, you, if you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for a certainty the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations but before you. But they shall become snares and traps to you, and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. I want you to just take a moment to just... Listen to the, that about thorns and your side. It may help you think differently about the thorn in the flesh that Paul had. This is not the only time in the Old Testament the Lord describes people as thorns in your side. And this one is thorns in your eyes. But it's not just all of a sudden there's a New Testament phrase that Paul said, lest I be exalted above measure because of the abundance of revelation uh, that I received, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. And we just read that as though it, he's got some physical. Uh, that's, that's, that's our lack of understanding that this phrase uh, is used in a very similar way, not the exact same phrase, but in a very, very similar way. And so, so I know that uh, uh, the, the statement says that uh, uh, there'll, there'll be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes. You want to get the graphic, you ever have, ever have a little, little splinter in, or not a splinter, just a piece of dust in your eye? Can you imagine what it would be like to have a thorn in your eyes? That's what these nations were. I mean, that is, that's that poetical language that is, that is figurative, that is just unbelievable. And that's exactly what they became. And so he says, uh, he will no longer uh, treat you the way you've been treating I this day, verse 14, go in the way of all the earth. How's that for a way, great way of saying I'm going to die? I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and in your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All has come to pass, not one single word has failed. Everything He promised them about giving them that land, it has been fulfilled. And therefore it shall come to pass that all the good things that have come upon you which the Lord your God promised you, the Lord, because of His very nature, will bring all of it. You can count on Him to bring all these good things on you, but you need to understand that uh, the justice of God, the very nature of God, is to punish those, is to punish those who, who are disobedient. Uh, chapter 24, verse 2, you can overcome genetics. Uh, the word genetics doesn't seem to be in verse 2, but how's this for someone overcoming genetics? Joshua 24, verse 2, uh, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times. And look what's stated. And they, who's the they? Terah and Nahor, your fathers, they served over other gods. Abraham's father was an idolater. And you don't get that, you know, back over there in the book of, you know, you, you, you don't get that in the book of Genesis. But they served other gods. That's remarkable, isn't it? Look at verse 15 that says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. You and I need to understand, well, there, there's the hornets, but choices must be made now. Choose you this day whom ye you, whom you, whom you will serve. And so we need to... Uh, 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 need to be aware of that. Time's going to get us, and the bell, I guess the first bell has rung or should ring, or has it rung? Or the response of Joshua's generation, and that is uh, they served God. All of those people who were out in the wilderness, they were faithful to God. 
but I put up there the, uh, uh, the, the next generation, and, the, and I, went, I put the book of Judges, because that's what we'll be studying here next. One generation after they got to the promised land, they have left God. And so our Wednesday night study in the, in the next quarter is just going to be a continuation of this. But let me tell you, the Lord's church is one generation from extinction. You've you got to think about that. If we don't, if we don't build within our children faith, our children are going to grow up like, uh, uh, like those who grew up here in Baal and Ashtaroth whenever they did not remove the names of those gods out of the land, and our children will do that. What a grave responsibility that is. Now, the church is going to survive. I just want my children to be in it. Is that the page you're on in, in relationship to that? We have that responsibility. Let's recognize it. I've enjoyed, thank the way you've been interested in the, the study of Joshua. I hope you've learned some things, and uh, we'll take up the next study with the book of Judges. Let's...